Welcome everybody. Good morning, I am Paolo Cignoni from the Italian National Research Council. Welcome to the full paper session eight on optimizing structures, layout and interaction. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to chair this virtual session. Uh, we have uh, four uh, engaging papers uh, uh, this morning. All of these uh, papers on uh, vertebral, on uh, connected uh, topics, uh, while uh, slightly different on, on, on themes. And we will start with the first paper that is titled uh, uh, Invertible Paradoxic, Paradoxic Loop Structures for Transformable Design. The authors are Jia Li, uh, Georg Nauratil, Florian Rist, and Michael Enstel, and will be presented by Jia Li and Florian Rist. Hello everyone, I'm Zia Li, I'm from JQ Linz in Austria. This talk is about invertible paradoxical loop structures for transformable design. This is a joint work with Georg Navartil, Florian Rist, Michael Hansen from TU Wien. Here is the content of uh, my talk, which contains uh, six parts. First, let's see the introduction. So, the aim of this paper is to open a new design space for paradoxical closed six R chains from the perspective of transformable design, focusing on this aesthetic transformation under functional aspects. For instance, shading system. Uh, the, the shading system has this one parametric mobility, the time t of the day. Uh, another benefit is that we would like to use the invertible loop, then no need for retaining in the night. Uh, in addition, we also use the rational motions for the motion synthesis. We present an interactive tool uh, in Rhino Grasshopper <coughs> such that non-expert uh, non user to create their invertible loop which are self collision free over the complete motion cycle. Uh, there are also interactions between the user and the tools. Let's see some examples. We saw many awnings on the street. Uh, those awnings came from this Zara 6R linkage, which can only do the straight line motion. Another yeah, 6R linkage is the invertible, uh, invertible cube from Shards. Here is the animation for the invertible, which means complete motion, uh, uh, collision free among the complete motion cycle. But one can see that if you hold it with one bar, the collision might collide with your hand. So this is not the best feature we want. So in this paper, we use uh, another type of 6R linkage. So First, uh, one additional property for this linkage, all the rotation joints will be 360 degree rotated and the direction is fixed. Okay. A sketch of uh, the workflow of this uh, project is we start motion design, namely uh, rational uh, cubic motion, and then we have the factorization of motion polynomial to get the geometry of the linkage. Uh, with knowing the geometry of the linkage, we can start uh, the link design uh, for this linkage design, namely just the uh, shape of the, all these links. In addition, the grounding issue is also solved. So let's see the kinematics plate, which is the second part of my talk. Because we use the rigid body motion, so the special Euclidean group <coughs> is used here. In, instead of using the 4x4 four four linear matrix, we use the dual quaternions, which is eight-dimensional real vector space. Uh, in fact, uh, the most interesting uh, subset for the dual quaternion is the Sudi quadric, namely those uh, dual quaternions with the real norm. For those uh, non-real real norm dual quaternions, which can be identified with uh, the special Euclidean group by the following map, for those not on the studio quadric uh, point, 
uh, of the dual quaternions, we can do the back projection, namely just change the dual part such that it is uh, lie on the studio quadric. So parallel to the studio quadric, we define these motion polynomials, namely those uh, motion, uh, these polynomials in the universal polynomial dual quaternion ring, dual uh, DHT, uh, with the real norm polynomials. And most of the case, we uh, restrict itself to monic case uh, for those motions which passing through the identity when uh, t is equal to, to infinity. For the universal polynomial, the most interesting is that we, we can do the factorization. Here, for generic motion and polynomial, we, there's n factorial, at most n factorial factorizations. The, uh, because for the linear factor here, those linear factors, they corresponding to the rotation joint axis, you can tell the geometry. And for this paper, we only use the cubic motion polynomial. There are six uh, factorizations, which can be cheaply, uh, cheaply uh, obtained by a Bennett flip. Namely, you change the two factor here, you get another two factor. We can visualize this, this factor, factorization by such a schematic figure. Namely, one factorization corresponding uh, uh, to one color chain, and the black dot is the rotation joint. And then one can uh, see that this chord, the gray chord, is actually corresponding to a Bennett flip. Namely, these two, you get the other two. And then uh, another for the construction linkage, namely, we call it the loop combination, is that you combine one chain with another chain, you get uh, a 6 R linkage. However, here is on the geometry of linkage, namely you know the rotation axis where they located, but somehow, uh, how do you connect those rotation axes, namely the links? Either you can take this uh, straight line or a cylinder, or you can bind uh, with. So the link shape will be defined later, we call it the link design space. But first, let's see how do we get uh, this reasonable useful mm, cubic motion, namely that's the motion design. A cubic motion here we written by uh, uh, this yellow curve here. Here is the identity. And uh, we try to use like, this cubic uh, curve to approximate some poses, which are called the target poses. And for the opposition, we use this fun distant function, namely the metric, came from this initial ellipsoid defined by the sixth uh, vertex. In our case, it's based on the moving object, namely the shading element. However, because there's a cubic motion we are interested in, and um, for four poles, uh, with knowing four poles, actually there exists a cubic motion interpolation procedure. And because of four poles in the space, which define a three space, and the studio quadric in the static three space will be this, this green quadric. To, uh, uh, for existing um, a cubic motion, on studio quadric, then there must be another ruling or a line, which this line shared by two quadrics, and then that the cubic intersects in this way. So for this interpolation procedure, there are two family solutions. Each one has one dimensional solutions. Uh, just one thing, the visiting order for the target post might be wrong because, uh, from the interpolation. So we either have to switch family or change the initial input of four poses. So the singularity issue is uh, uh, ex ex excluded because they are based on a univariate polynomial. And we also use the, this uh, Rhino Grasshopper tool Galapagos, which applies the evolution, basic evolutionary logic for optimization. When you have more than four poses, for instance, here we have six poses, and then for uh, this approximation, actually, we define uh, for each pose the um, uh, target pose on the curve. So we try to do the approximation by a curve evolution procedure. So we have the initial guess, uh, guess either by four pose interpolation or random uh, quaternions. And then for the guiding pose, one can choose the closed the pose in the projection, like here, close it or you have the proportional space because for random quaternion, you, the order might be wrong. So 
uh, the co-evolution algorithm works uh, for the three stage. In the first uh, or the uh, initial stage, uh, we choose this uh, proportional spaced uh, uh, guiding pose, uh, and for the uh, parameterization, actually we choose a linear parameterization for simplify the computation. Here we need a batch back projection, and in the middle stage, once you have this uh, correct or uh, visiting order, then we change to the closed the pose projection. Still we need back projection. In the final stage, when uh, the curve is uh, close enough to the target pose, we change to the studic uh, parameterization, then we don't need the back projection. One can see this uh, cost of function was decreasing by all statics, but here there might be a jump with the cost of function. Because we found this uh, loop phenomenon, uh, because we, for the cubic motion in the closed curve, and here might be a loop, but in the target pose, might, there's no loop. So we ha have to uh, change to the beginning for this curve evolution. <coughs> So the, here are the comments for the curve evolution. We use the uh, four pose interpolation of the good initial guess. Galpa ghost was uh, used to find a good step size. If the correct order, uh, with the order is damaged or not achieved, then we proceed with the random initial guess. And the singularity issue was also solved. Now we can start our uh, linkage design, namely shaping the links for the linkage. Of course, we already said by the kinematics, we know the geometry of linkage, namely we know this uh, green line segment or denoted the rotation axis here, this uh, six uh, rotation axis. And how do we define the link? Uh, traditional convention in the mechanism is that you find this uh, mineral distance, this uh, red uh, uh, line segment for the links. But here, we uh, change this convention to another one. And we will just pick a point on the rotation axis and then connect these six points to get the six line segment. After this, we can do a post procedure that is like an offsetting procedure, namely, we just shift this. So the realization algorithm was divided in such a way that first we define a initial starting procedure, start initial. Uh, Internationalization for our procedure is that we take this summation to the minimal and then we do the collision check. Uh, if we have uh, no collision, then we do the offsetting. But if there's a collision, we go to a search strategy, namely to change the point on the rotation axis. Here, change the point, the moving of the point on the rotation axis. Then we go back to this night pass uh, collision uh, checks. After we get a collision free linkage, and then we add all of that. Here we just need to do uh, additional more edge edge collision checks. In addition, the any factor can be also integrated in the collision check, for instance, with the disk or line segment. Uh, one can expect that we get a bigger linkage when we integrate the any factor. But for our purpose, this would be uh, necessary and useful, helpful. Uh, because somehow we are interested in the shading system. Here's uh, the shading um, part came from the end effector. After we get uh, this uh, collision free linkage here, one can see that this is still just uh, line segments and or uh, very thin cylinders. So the next step is that you might co define complete link design spacing. Here we start with a post-processing algorithm, namely for each link, uh, the user defines the potential link design space, for instance, uh, a cylinder. Then the potential uh, link design space is trimmed by the other line segment or other shapes. And then the Boolean difference uh, was done by this trim procedure. Why is illustration look like this? Uh, and another one, for instance, here, the cylinders was cut off. In addition, for this uh, link design space, we also solved this uh, grounding issue uh, because in, we thought in what we cube had this grounding problem. That we, we solved the grounding by extending one rotation joint because we found that if we uh, keep the, the, uh, the uh, base link, then there's always collision. But once we extend one joint, of this uh, base link, there is no collision anymore. 
let's see a summary for this linkage design. So, 2000 validated test was succeeded for this realization algorithm with, uh, and then there's uh, link design, collision, and free link design space was generated for, from line segment. Uh, the, the loop grounding problem is also solved. Now let's see some results and the discussion for the results. So first let's see the difficulty we faced in the beginning. First is uh, except uh, this uh, inward cube, there's no other linkage used in the uh, application. <clears throat> so there's, uh, uh, in addition, there's no established uh, design method for design of these kinematic structures, which are essentially inaccessible by intuition design approaches. So in order to uh, tackle this uh, challenge, we run a linked master level student course uh, that with uh, 12 students from architectures. And the students are asked to use the, the presented tool to design a kinetic structure with focusing on the sculptural qualities or functional aspects, namely the dynamic shading system. Uh, in the end, two physics model even uh, build it. Here I have only discussed uh, two examples. First is the Chautic Relay. Actually here, a series of target poses from the motion of the sun was synthesis. And the, uh, the other one is the, the artificial trace. So let's see the animation. First is the Chautic Relay. Here. The installation used two linkages to move a shading. <coughs> Uh, sh uh, sh uh, uh, element insisted with the sound in such a way that here on the surface of public square remains static, the static shadow. So actually, this simple idea has already implies a complicated task, uh, design task for the motion uh, to get this station or shadow. Uh, what we did is that we used uh, interactive implementation of four-post interpolation by means of space mouse uh, to get this input. Uh, then a, a symmetric reflection for getting these two linkages. Okay, let's see the next one, I think. Yes, here's the uh, animation of the artificial trees. This installation relates to the shadow pattern cast by existing trees in the select site and seek to mimic this uh, shadow pattern and related the light qualities. So in addition, this artificial tree was built physically. Uh, so it was fabricated by the use of computer controlled uh, machines to achieve the necessary accuracy ensuring the mobility. Okay. Now let's come to the, my conclusion. We gave an interactive tool in Rhino Grasshopper such that uh, we can build this invertible paradoxical loop with six uh, rotation joints and the motion design uh, for the four post interpolation or motion evolution. And the linkage are self collision free over the complete motion cycle. Uh, we also implemented this in, uh, using the master level studio course to result even what fabricated. And the future work is that this, uh, we can expect uh, uh, extension for the Bennett mechanism. Uh, which is the 4R, or Goldberg uh, linkage, which uh, has a uh, 5R, or even with uh, the P-joint closed loop structures. Uh, for the network linkage, there might be also uh, extension, but here might not only be cubic motion, uh, one can expect with a higher degree. Uh, the singularity for such a rational 6R loops was also interesting for us. 
in the future. And then the next one is uh, for the evolution algorithm, uh, we use the two norms. Uh, for changing the norms, that uh, would be also one interesting topic for us in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you for, for your very nice presentation. Let's see if uh, there are any questions in, in the chat or in the, in the Discord room. Let's see, check. If you have any questions, feel free to write them both in the chat and in the room. Okay, I don't see any chat. Any questions? So I have one at least. Uh, the, the, the first question that I have is, uh, uh, what about uh, the uh, physics simulation, uh, the static evaluation of these structures? I mean, I, I see that the, the uh, motion that uh, the, this uh, kinematic structure exhibits, it's very complex and it's very non-linear. So, so I see sometimes that in response to a very small rotation somewhere, you see large rotation in other parts. So actually, what are the, the torque that you have to apply in order to actuate uh, this uh, kind of mechanism? Is something that can be controlled during the optimization process or not? Uh, maybe, I, <clears throat> maybe I start first and then Floria and then after. Uh, so firstly, uh, we also saw this uh, phenomenon that uh, at some joints uh, with the smaller rotated, but the other parts uh, rotate a lot. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, we actually uh, did not uh, go to more detail for this optimization issue regarding all the talk uh, issues for controlling like uh, the robot, because for our mechanism, uh, in principle, you only need one motor actually for the general robotics uh, like an industry arm um, they have the multiple motors so we have the torque control for each uh, motors but here we only have one motor and uh, this one you can pick one which actually uh, like the generator of the, all the motions which can be very smooth but the others might not so that's the, the uh, let's say the phenomenon and the, the issue I can talk. And uh, for the implementation issue or the, the physical models, maybe Florian can uh, say more words, I think. Yeah, Florian? For the actual physical models, we did not do any kind of analysis of this. Uh, can you speak a bit analysis. louder, please? Uh, ah, sorry, for the physical models, we did not do any quantitative analysis of these torques or other forces involved. Uh, because we, this was all built on a model scale only, and this would have been out of scope for this rather small design project with students of architecture. Um, and as you could also see in the videos, the models were not like self-actuating, but they needed to be actuated manually. So we kind of excluded this problem from the design uh, task for our students to avoid this overcomplication of this problem. Uh, for practical realization, actually, uh, if this is a real problem, it can be kind of overcome by using multiple motors, but of course then this introduces other control issues which are more difficult to overcome. Okay, thank you. Let's see if uh, there are any questions. I don't see any. So, okay. Thanks again, the uh, presenters. Uh, and uh, we, I think that we can move to the next uh, presentation. The next paper is uh, entitled Interactive Modeling of uh, Cellular Structures on Surfaces with Application to uh, Additive Manufacturing. It uh, will pre be presented by uh, Pascal uh, Stadelbauer and uh, Raleb Zayer. And the authors are Pascal Stadelbauer, Daniel Michael, Hans-Peter Seidel, Marcus Steinberg and Raleb Zayer. Welcome to this talk. 
My name is Pascal Schalbo and I will be presenting interactive modeling of cellular structures and surfaces with application to additive manufacturing. Tessellations are very common in nature. They can be, for example, seen in shirel fur, leaves or bubbles. These patterns are visually very attractive and have a certain artistic appeal due to their characteristic layout. It is no wonder that artists adapted natural tessellations for their work. They are often used in sculptures, buildings or even household items like lamps. Tessellations are commonly mathematically expressed by centroidal Voronoi tessellations. These are created from a Voronoi diagram. The seeds are moved to the centroids to create a more regular layout. This can be done iteratively or can be formulated as an optimization problem and therefore be solved by LBFGS, a numerical solver. Most formulations work well in planar and volumetric settings. Evaluations on surfaces, on the other hand, are a bit more difficult. They have to be performed either as a restriction of a volumetric configuration or in the plane by means of surface parametrization. The bottleneck of the restricted Voronoi diagram generation is the numerical solver, and finding an efficient parallelized solution for a numerical solver is challenging. There have been improvements for the Lonely computations, but streaming the overall RVD procedure is still difficult. For surface parametrization, well working GPU implementations exist, but these suffer from metric distortions. Extension to hyperbolic setting offers partial remedies, but still suffers conformal distortions. If our goal is to interactively edit tessellations, both methods are not ideal. One is limited by the solver and too slow, and the other shows distortions, which means this is also not usable in a scenario where interaction on the surface takes place. There are a few requirements for an ideal editing procedure. First, for artists to realize the idea of the model as best as possible, an immediate feedback is important. Placing seeds and waiting for the tessellation to be generated is not a practical workflow, making interactivity for efficient tessellation design inevitable. Second, the artist must have several editing operations available. And third, he must have as much control over the tessellation as possible. This is why, to create an interactive modeling method, we use the layered fields approach shown by Zayador. Using this natively parallel method allows us to create an interactive pipeline on the GPU, which lets us implement editing primitives and gives the artist full interactive control of a natural tessellation. The layered fields approach spreads regions from seed points located at vertices on the mesh. This is similar to a diffusion process, but follows certain rules. They define a spread of those regions without an overlap. They also create narrow bands between neighboring regions based on a transition function. The first rule states that at every point on the surface, the contribution of each field summed up is 1. Integrity and locality of the individual cells is kept by the second rule. The third one defines distinguishability of the individual narrow bands, and the fourth determines the behavior of region boundaries when they meet. The minimization of the Lagrangian then gives this equation. We use this algorithm plus several efficiency improvements as our base implementation that gives us the initial layout. We will now take a look at our editing process. To begin the natural tessellation creation process, we need a starting seed layout. Because placing seeds manually would take a considerable amount of time, we experimented with different seed initializations to help starting the editing process. A course of oxalation can be achieved by dividing the bounding box of the model. This can be useful when creating a physical model. For enclosing features by editing, a random initialization is shown to be a quite good starting point. We usually use this as a base and then run a few Lloyd-like iterations to produce a well-distributed starting initialization as shown on the right. 
editing a cell, for example by movement, only affects a local area. This means we only need to consider the cell that is manipulated and its neighbors. Which gives us the advantage that we do not have to rerun the whole layered fields algorithm. We restrict out the process to this area of interest and therefore speed up the whole process significantly. The area of interest consists of the cell the seed is located in and its direct neighbors. We extract columns associated with vertices inside this area from the mesh matrix and also from the Laplacian. As a result, the dimensions of the matrices involved in the matrix matrix multiplications done in the update process are significantly reduced, which therefore results in faster updates. After the update, the extracted parts are then merged back into the matrices. To give the artist control over seed placement, we define three basic seed editing operations insertion, removal, and movement. Seeds are usually placed when additional features should be covered by a new cell. For example, the eye is seen here. Insertion detects the cell it is placed in and uses it and its immediate neighborhood as the active area. We added seed removal to remove cells that are for example too small, as seen here in the braid. Seed removal removes the layer from the layered field and lets neighboring fields propagate until equilibrium is reached again. When overall cell distribution is as desired, but some cells are not well placed, seed movement is used. Seed movement resets the seed to be moved, the destination cell and the neighborhoods. After the seed is moved, these cells fill the empty space again. Two cell-based editing methods became quite useful, cell merging and cell freezing. Cell merging is used to combine two or more smaller cells to one bigger cell, to enclose for example the braids of the Bimber model. This is done by merging the layers of the field model. Cell freezing is used to hold well positioned cells in place. The ear shown here is frozen to avoid unwanted changes to the cell during further editing. The cells are extracted from the field matrix representation in order to freeze them. For convenience, we added tools to place multiple seeds at once. To create a tennis ball, for example, we use heat lines. A circular placement was used to create the center part of a lamp. Region painting is useful when a special region that has a specific outline needs to be covered. One practical use case where advantages of natural tessellations can be applied to is additive manufacturing. The natural tessellation not only shows visually pleasing results, but also good stability through the natural growth process. We will show how this interactive editing, including the underlying model, can be used through a whole production pipeline to create a 3D printed model. Over the last decade, additive manufacturing has become more and more popular. It started as a simple prototyping process and now is a way of rapid manufacturing. What still affects producibility most are material cost, a limited build volume and printing time depending on the method used, of course. Material extrusion and light polymerization are often used in non-industrial 3D printing. These techniques require support structures, which requires post-processing of the model. Methods like selective laser sintering or multi-jet fusion eliminate the need for support structures, which makes the process easier, but the use of new materials and more sophisticated processes increases the material cost and printing time even more. To decrease material cost, we propose splitting a mesh in a thicker load-carrying skeleton and thin shells. Shells are placed onto the skeleton and cover most of the area. This reduces the overall material usage while keeping up stability. The border regions of the layered fields define the skeleton and the cells define the shells. We further divide the skeleton to make it fit into smaller printers with smaller printing volumes. Here is an overview video for the proposed technique.
the skeleton and the shells are split. After that the skeleton is divided based on the dual mesh. Individual skeleton parts can be reconnected, for example using screws or nuts. The shells are then placed onto a step on the skeleton. To avoid wasted printing space, we pack all parts into the printing volume as tightly as possible. As mentioned before, we use the narrow bands between the cells to create a skeleton. We have the advantage that the layered fields model gives us a good transition to and from these narrow bands. This means we can pick a threshold and define isolines on the surface using the field values in order to create the skeleton. For stronger skeletons, we can run into the problem of a limited transition region. Field values are clamped between 0 and 1, which results in no further change when we are already in the cell and the field value is always 1. Additionally, when these values get close to 0 and 1, they lose the smoothness resulted in jagged lines. This is why we create the isolines differently. We reverse the field flow by inverting the sign of the boundary coefficient. This way we are able to shrink the fields a bit and create new isolines. These lines are then adjusted with the number of iterations run in reverse. To adapt to different stability requirements, we adjust the skeleton shell generation. One can fine-tune step height, width and count in order to minimize material cost while keeping the required stability. You can see different step counts in the upper image and different layer widths in the lower image. To reassemble the skeleton after printing, we use connectors. These are adjusted based on the materials used and forces applied to the model. We use for example snap connectors for light plastics with minimal force applied to it and screws and nuts for models that should be robust. In order not to create a giant puzzle with no instructions on how to assemble it after printing, we give every shell a unique number and put the label on the inside surface of the shell. And for the skeleton parts, we write the adjacent shell numbers on each connector. In order to make the assembly even easier, we enumerate the shells in a specific manner. We tested different ordering methods, for example Hilbert order, to order the shells and therefore create an enumeration. Spectral ordering has shown to be the best in our case. Applying this procedure, we know during assembly that numbers close to each other are also close on the model. You can see random ordering on the left and spectral ordering on the right. Used bill volume and the number of batches to print have significant influence on printing costs. For our printing scenarios, we use multi-jet fusion, which doesn't require support structures. Because of this, and the fact that our skeleton is split into small parts and we produce potato chip-like shells, we can pack everything tightly into the bill volume. This reduces the printing cost immensely. In practice, we pack using NetFab but there are also other well-working techniques. Within our skeleton shell's decomposition, we channel the stability of the structure to the skeleton, without inducing much material cost changes, while conveniently controlling both step layout and shell thickness. We simulate a force on the chair model with two and three steps and a step height of one millimeter to show changing robustness. In this simulation, we use the 10 nodes tetrahedron and the material properties of printed nylon substrate MJF P812. The two step model shows a displacement of 0.873 mm when 10 newtons are applied to the sitting area. The three step model only shows a displacement of 0.523 mm. We also looked at how robustness of the skeleton shell structure compares to a solid model with the same material usage. For the two-step model, a 1.122 mm solid model was looked at. This model would show displacement of 1.197 mm and therefore indicates 
higher robustness when using the naturally tessellated skeleton shell structure. We also printed two chair models to show how stability can be adjusted by different skeleton settings. One can see a two-step model with 0.6mm step height on the left and a three-step model with 1mm steps on the right. You can see different weights applied to them. As a proof of concept, we printed a 500mm version of the Bimba model using multi-jet fusion. Important features like bow, eyes, nose were enclosed in regions to preserve these features without discontinuities. Nuts and screws were used to combine 134 skeleton parts. The 88 shells were then placed onto the skeleton. To show how our method works and can be used, we show the editing process of the BIMA model here. Some rendered results produced through the proposed editing process are shown here. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, let's see if there are any questions in the in the chat. Okay, I see one in the Discord room. Okay, uh, have you considered using different metrics when creating the cells in order to obtain different visual effects? It's a good question. Um, no, not really. It's a work in, in progress and we're looking into that, but yeah, but nothing considered yet. Okay, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, I have another question. Uh, I've seen that the shape of the cells can be complex sometimes. And uh, can there be sometimes problems in extracting the uh, potato chip-like shells that you apply? Because I, I, if, for example, the uh, Voronoi cells became slightly uh, very curved or very curved like uh, when you are around the tube, could it be difficult to apply that shells to the, to the um, uh, framework structure? You mean when constructing it? Yes. Um, hmm. Because in most cases, I see that the shapes of the cells is almost flat. But sometimes I've seen, for example, in the in the back of the head of the Bimba models, you you can have some complicated shapes. Well, we haven't run into the problem yet because we also try to we already try to combine these kind of cells in a good way to yeah to combine these features, and so they are usually blacked on on the outside and kind of that. So. I mean, there could be scenarios, but that's, yeah. But, but the, yes, by editing, you can solve it. Okay. Yeah. 
thank you. Thank you again for, for the, 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 uh, the oh, okay, see other questions. Yes, it's possible uh, to expand the pieces to contain sharp corners and to get rid of the frame. So I guess this means around the around corners. Yeah. I mean, everything on the surface is possibly if I understand, if I understand the, the question correctly. Yeah, I think so. And I see another question. Would it, uh, would it uh, be possible to use the Voronoi skeleton only internally and make the shells slightly bigger so that uh, these covers the model seamlessly? Yes, we're also <laughs> looking into that. And yeah, there could be a few applications Yeah, based yeah. on this but approach. would be interesting. OK. Thank you again for, for uh, your answer. Let's thanks again Thank and, and clap the, the, the speakers. And uh, let's uh, move to the next uh, paper that is titled uh, Illumination with the Furniture Layout Optimization, authored by Nick Vissas, uh, Georgios Papayano, Anastasia Gakavarelis, and Andreas Alexandros Vasilakis. Uh, Nick Vissas and George Papayano will present the paper. My name is Nick Fitzes. I'm a PhD student from the Computer Graphics Group of the Athens University of Economics and Business. This is a presentation of our work on illumination-guided furniture layout optimization. Lighting, both artificial and natural, is one of the most important aspects of interior design. It affects the mood, the aesthetics and the utility of the scene and its objects. An apartment living room set needs a cozy lighting ambience. An office room requires workstations positioned under lighting conditions that favor uninterrupted work. Each furniture cluster can have very specific lighting requirements under different scenarios. We will show how lighting need not only be an afterthought, but can also guide an automatic furniture layout process to produce valid furniture arrangement. Furniture layout falls under the general category of inverse geometry problems. In these types of problems, we want to optimize geometry via parametric or direct manipulation driven by specific constraints and goals. Interior design specifically combines a selection of 3D objects, the geometry of the space to be populated, and a particular set of constraints and goals. Constraints with respect to space geometry, ergonomics, utility, safety, aesthetics, and illumination, which have been practically neglected so far. An automatic system should take these inputs and propose valid and optimal parameter states of the geometry with respect to these constraints and goals. Interior layout arrangement has seen great interest in our field. Many methods have been proposed over the years. There have been assistive methods, semi-automatic and automatic methods, methods based on object relationships, and lately, deep learning approaches. Still, lighting constraints have been largely neglected. Such methods can be very useful to an interior designer professional. Looking at the designer's pipeline, we have a selection of objects that need to be arranged under certain constraints. Lighting is a core aspect of this process, with each room or furniture cluster requiring different illumination levels in order to prove functional. In terms of constraints, a designer's thought process looks like this. As we saw earlier, there are many different types of constraints. Most of them can easily be described mathematically. Specifically for lighting, measuring the effectiveness of illumination in terms of task-specific target illuminance or intensity levels is an established procedure for professionals. Accounting for correct lighting is not always obvious. Illumination can drastically change the utility and effectiveness of a space. Consider the following example. At a glance, both setups seem to support the space's utility equally, a computer lab room. However, one setup does not account for any lighting goals and only respects geometric constraints. Without taking lighting into account, monitors in the first setup showcase extreme glare levels 
which will make the operator's job much more difficult and strenuous. We need a method that accounts for such sliding goals and integrates nicely in a designer's pipeline. In this work, we saw how to introduce illumination constraints and combine them with geometric ones in a unified manner that can be used to generate plausible furniture layout interiors in a wide range of scenarios. Our idea is directly applicable to the typical pipeline of an interior designer. For an arbitrary 3D space, the designer is responsible for providing the following. The geometry of the interior, the lighting setup, which includes ceiling lights, stand lights, etc., and windows and openings. Windows and openings are specifically required to account for natural lighting from the sky, dome and sun, which are the biggest contributors when applicable. Of course, the selection of objects for the particular setup is also given. These objects can also include movable luminaires, which are elegantly handled by our proposed framework and can be used to complement existing stationary light sources. We need to respect an object's geometric properties in order to correctly position it with respect to the scene and other objects. Therefore, each object is defined by its bounding volume calculated as its oriented bounding box, its facing direction vectors which represent either axis directions to the furniture piece or a practical side for alignment, one or more subspace intervals which represent disjoint subspaces of valid transformations. All these properties need to be defined once for each object. Subspace intervals in particular allow to incorporate very tight and disconnected constrained spaces and are supported in our framework. This is a key aspect of constrained engineering in interior design. The designer needs an easy way to describe disjoint subspaces for the objects. This could be the different rooms of an apartment or the walls on which a cupboard can rest. Objects can also be grouped together into single entities. This allows for meaningful clustering of related objects, coherent move of related objects, optimization at both group and object level, intra-group exploration and optimization strategies. Groups have the same degree of freedom as objects and are seamlessly handled by our framework. Typical use cases for grouping is a dining table and its chairs or a living room set. The important thing to keep here is that objects within groups can still move in the group's local space, retaining all their individual freedoms and geometric constraints. And now that we've talked about how we define objects, groups and their degree of freedom, we continue discussing how we incorporate lighting and geometric constraints. We support three types of lighting constraints through the use of illumination samplers. Samplers are used to measure illumination levels using physically based light transport solvers. Illumination targets and quantities directly map to an interior designer's workflow using photometric units. Our framework specifically uses looks and needs accordingly. Samplers can be attached to any object, therefore respecting its movement, or be freestanding. We define them separately from the object's geometry so that they can be easily transferable between scenes and scenarios. Firstly, we have planar samplers, used to uniformly sample illumination over a rectangular area. They are defined by their position, dimensions, and target illumination level range in looks. Next, we have directional samplers. They sample luminance over regularly divided strata of a frustum. We use the max of average luminances of each stratum as the representative value. They are defined by their direction, field of view, stratification factor of the frustum, and target luminance range in nits. Lastly, we have volume samplers. Uniformly sample luminance in a bounded volume. They are defined by position, extents, and target luminance range in nits. Here are some simple examples to better illustrate the utility of each constraint. The planar sampler 
is useful for setting target illumination levels over specific furniture pieces. Here, the table and bookshelf use a planner sampler. After optimization, both of them are positioned so that illumination targets are respected. Directional samplers are useful for suppressing the glare problem we saw in the beginning, as well as other generic directional luminance targets. Here, the desk and monitor positioning are optimized in order to minimize glare while maintaining adequate illumination levels on the desk surface through a planner sampler. Keep in mind that excessive glare can be caused both from direct and indirect lighting paths. Lastly, volume samplers are useful for setting average luminance and ambience targets in specific parts of space. In this example, we want to achieve adequate illumination in the space in front of the projection screen for the presenter. Complementary samplers are used to achieve pleasant illumination on the desk and low glare on the projector screen. Note how in all three samples, parts of space like the overbright spot near windows or underlit areas are avoided only by the specified lighting goals. There is no geometric constraint generic enough to handle these cases. It's important to also note that all three types of samplers require physically based light transport evaluators in order to correctly account for the wide range of surface materials and geometric formations like highly reflective surfaces, densely occupied environments or openings with overhangs. Moving on, in terms of geometric constraints, we support distance, penetration, alignment, focus and conversation constraints. They are easily defined with a valid range from a lower to an upper bound. Distance constraints are between the centers of two objects. Penetration refers to the amount of overlap between two objects. For speed, we use a voxelized representation of each object and use the number of overlapping voxels in our calculations. Alignment is evaluated with the angle between the facing vectors of each object. Focus and conversation are two very important functional constraints with respect to the utility of the interior. We enforce them through the combination of alignment and distance constraints. We wanted to allow for marginal violations of both geometric and lighting constraints in order to favor a wider exploration of the parametric space and reach optimal states in terms of illumination. We call them elastic constraints. The idea is to have a leeway region outside the bounds that still considers the state valid but with added cost. A distance constraint between a sofa and a TV set would be evaluated like this. Here, B max and B min are the constraints bounds. The formula we used is modeled after elastic springs and the graph on the top right shows its behavior. This is a valid setup with zero cost as the distance is between the bounds. This is a valid setup with added cost. This is an invalid setup that is rejected. Note that specifically for lighting constraints there is no invalid region since lighting goals could practically be unattainable under certain scenarios. The discussed formulation of both geometric and lighting constraints allowed us to combine them in a cost minimization framework with the following cost function. This is a very hard function to optimize. It is characterized by discontinuities, many local minima, a large search space and the difficulty to sample valid states. We combine groups, subspace intervals and a mutation strategy into a hierarchical Markov chain Monte Carlo process to meaningfully explore the large search space. Our mutation step uses one of four actions in random. Move and rotate actions generate states in the current subspace. Jump actions randomly choose a different interval subspace of the object and move there. Swap actions exchange the position of two entities only if their interval subspaces partially match. Here's an overview of the algorithm. Firstly, each object 
holds its current state, including position, rotation, and current subspace. Our algorithm works hierarchically, working from the group level down to the optic level. At each step, a state mutation is sampled and the state is evaluated in terms of its geometric constraints. If no violations have taken place, the algorithm proceeds to evaluate the lighting samplers which are used to enforce the illumination constraint. Note that lighting is evaluated only for shades that satisfy the geometric constraints because they are far more computationally expensive. Following is a clip showing our algorithm in action in a two-room apartment. Notice how both objects and groups make use of disjoint interval subspaces for meaningful exploration. Also notice how the individual freedoms of each object are respected, for example within the living room set, providing for radical but meaningful intra-group arrangements. And now, our algorithm in action. The following examples showcase automatically proposed furniture arrangements in different scenarios. All proposed layouts were reviewed by a professional designer. First, we have a proposed arrangement for the two-room apartment with two light panels and three windows. This is a well-lit room. The trickiest lighting goal here is glare avoidance. Our algorithm is successful in finding one of the few arrangements that minimizes glare on the TV screen while keeping the table and living room set sufficiently illuminated. Next is an open office space with two windows and six light panels. The system was tasked with recommending arrangements for three different primary office hours. Both desk positioning and monitor orientation were put under optimization. We wanted low glare on screens and adequate lighting on desktops. Characteristic is the morning scenario where direct sunlight near windows is avoided by all desks. However, the space is effectively used for the night and afternoon case. Next, we have an event hosting scenario. The available space around the dance floor is effectively utilized, while tables clear the overlit dance area. The clip shows proposed arrangements for three event hours during the day's progression. In both day and night sessions, table placement is guided only by lighting goals. Lastly, we incorporate two movable light sources in an underlit night scenario of the two-room apartment. Two stand lights are included in the optimization in order to complement the insufficient ceiling light. The resulting arrangement achieves all target illumination goals with adequate lighting for the table and living room set along with glare avoidance for the TV screen. One expected limitation of the method is that whereas scenarios with attainable illumination goals converge quite fast, unrealistic or contradicting lighting intention may have a significant impact on both the convergence speed and the quality of the solution. Another missing feature of the current version is that we do not address any statistical illumination constraints over the planner and volume samplers, such as uniformity or minimum peak acceptable levels. Finally, Stochastic processes are in general very dependent on initial seed and the constraint space. Future directions and improvements 
include the investigation of machine learning for light field encoding and preference-based layout proposition since such approaches have produced promising results for scene synthesis tasks. To accommodate a wider range of user requirements and different design workflows, a broader use case study would greatly benefit our work. Finally, we are looking forward to extending our method for urban planning tasks where different sets of design guidelines apply. In conclusion, we showed the importance of lighting goals in interior design. Professionals have been hand-optimizing the layout, but since lighting goals can be explicitly described mathematically, we are able to incorporate them in an automatic system for layout suggestions. The three types of physically based illumination samplers we introduced to the layout problem can serve a variety of illumination goals, which can drastically affect the layout of interior spaces in ways that cannot be defined through other constraints. Our research group is actively researching several light-driven design problems. These include inverse geometry, lighting and opening problems. Visit us online and get in touch with us. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, let's see if uh, we have uh, any question from, from the audience in the chat. Let's see. I see there are a couple of comments about uh, using this approach also to uh, keep in uh, account uh, the uh, COVID constraints for a range in the res restaurant and zoo. That could be interesting. Can you comment on that? Yes, it sounds very interesting. <laughs> and <clears throat> I, I I didn't catch a comment. Can you repeat the question real quick? The comment. Yeah, the, the could be uh, constraint uh, like the COVID one uh, be included in this uh, set of constraints that you have to, to respect. That could be useful to, to for, uh, for example, rearranging the restaurant and other <laughs> and other offices and similar things. Well, it's a great idea, <laughs> and very easy to implement too. Uh, you just add some uh, distance constraints from specific types of uh, furniture. So yeah. Since distances are usually measured around chairs and other sitting places and utilities, yeah, this is very easy to achieve. Okay, let's see if uh, other question has appeared. Okay, the I yeah, there are no other questions. I have just uh, just one. Uh, it could be possible also to optimize for multiple arrangements. That is, uh, many spaces uh, has uh, not not a single usage, but two usage in, that involves moving uh, furniture around. Could be that then the position of the, the furniture optimized order in order also to minimize the effort of, of recombining things. Yeah. Um... This is um, something that we usually do um, effectively to account for different um, intervals within the day. Um, we specifically set the time intervals ourselves. So this is a constraint of the algorithm, what time of day to use. So if you let the algorithm uh, use the entire um, day, daylight or uh, night time or what 24 hour interval, then you actually optimize over any possible scenario. So um, what, what is in, inherent in this is that you cannot normally expect the same fidelity of solution as if you were optimizing for a specific uh, usable, more useful uh, interval. So let's say working hours or the times where the, the shops are open. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's naturally uh, obtainable. Okay, Thank, let's thanks again the presenters. Let's move on to the last uh, presentation. Thank you. Okay, the last presentation.
is a context aware mixed reality, a learning based framework for semantic level interaction. Uh, the authors are Long Chen, Wen Tang, Nigel John, Tao Ruan Wan, and Jian Zun Tang, and it will, it will be presented by Long Chen. Hello, everyone. I'm Long Chen from the Department of Creative Technology, Bournemouth University, UK. Today, I'm going to talk about my research paper. Context Aware Mixed Reality, a learning based framework for semantic level interaction. First of all, I believe there are three stages of the mixed reality. First is location aware MR, and then geometric aware MR, and finally, context aware MR. So, what is location aware MR? Location-aware MR system means that the MR system only knows your camera pose so that it can overlay virtual objects into the real world. It's like in this video that it shows a very popular mobile game called Pokemon Go that your camera pose is known so that it can overlay the virtual object into the real world and when you are moving your camera it has it creates the experience that the virtual object exists in the real world. However, the virtual object not only know where your camera moves, but it doesn't know anything about the surrounding environment. And with the advancement of the hardware such as the cameras and also the software such as computer vision algorithms, and there comes the geometric aware mixed reality system and the system knows your camera pose and also it can sense and reconstruct your environmental structure like in this video it shows that the microsoft hololens can build the environmental structure of your surrounding environment called spatial mapping and with this spatial mapping system it enables a lot of IMR applications such as, can, such as it can overlay a virtual screen on your wall and also uh, some buttons and also the visor map on the ground. And in this video, it shows that uh, the process of spatial mapping and this uh, demo shows that uh, it's a small game called Ball Pit in the Microsoft HoloLens. And you can see that the virtual object can interact with the geometric environment. And the object can be placed on the chair and it can fall onto the ground. However, this is only the basic interaction because the IMR system only know there is an object, but it doesn't know what it is. So what if, what if the MR system can know high level information such as this is a chair and this is ground and also the material of the chair and the ground so it can enable more applications. So what I, I was talking about is like a context of your MR system. That the MR system knows your camera pose, environmental structure, and also the object attributes. So this is also a demo of the Pokemon Go. However, you can see that the little monster can jump when the car is passing by to avoid the car. I believe this is just a co coincidence. However, it shows that uh, if this happens, it can greatly improve the MR appearance. And here's another demo. I believe it is edited. However, it's a good example of how the context MR works. So you see the little monster can be smashed by a lawnmower. However, this is extremely difficult because first, your MR system needs to understand 
what the object is, and when the object will reach your virtual object. And also, you should know the high-level information about how your virtual object can interact with the real world objects. So this is a very hard problem, and um, our state of art is just beyond the geometry aware, and the context aware is still a future. So, what my paper present is a common framework for context aware mixed reality. Basically, it is consists of four parts. So first one, you need an input sensor. And from the input sensor, it flows into the tracking and reconstruction stream. And you get the camera pose and 3D dense model. And in the same time, the output of the input sensor also flows to the context detection and fusion stream, which produces a semantic 3D model. And with this camera pose, and 73D model available, we can create an interactive MR interface, which creates the context-aware MR experience. So first, let's get into the input sensor. There are a lot of uh, different input sensors, and you can use a mono camera, which can be a web camera, or can be the phone camera. And also there are stereo camera available, which contains two lenses. And finally, there are more advanced camera called RGBD camera, which means with the RGB image and also the depth map available for this camera. Apparently, the RGBD camera is more accurate for our context aware MR system because we need the tracking and reconstruction. And with the depth map available, it can re we can get more accurate reconstruction and tracking result. However, the RGBD camera is much more expensive than stereo and mono camera. And second, let's talk about the tracking and reconstruction stream. So, Basically, there are two kinds of tracking and reconstruction methods. First one is tracking and sparse marking. So, there are many common methods such as feature-based slime, which is simultaneous localization and mapping system, and also the stretch from motion system. So the basic idea is to detect the feature points and reconstruct the landmark points. And also their optimization step to get an optimal reconstruction result and also the camera pose. However, this kind of feature-based SLAM system or structural motion system can also recon can only reconstruct sparse map point, which means we don't have the dense information of the environment. But there are other methods can reconstruct a dense map, such as the Kinect Fusion system, which uses the Kinect to reconstruct a dense map of the environment and also in the same time recover the camera poses. And also there are more advanced monocular uh, dense mapping and tracking system called DTAM. However, the real-time performance and the uh, quality is not as good as Connect Fusion because it uses a more advanced camera Connect that can get the depth map directly. Next, let's talk about context detection and fusion stream. Basically, the context detection is implemented by the semantic segmentation. There are many, many semantic segmentation systems such as IFCN, CRFIRN, UNITE, DeepLab, and SACNET. So I'm not going to um, get into the details of these systems, but the common idea is 
you input the RGBD, RGB image, and the image goes through a lot of CNN layers, which is comprised into smaller image, but it has higher level information. And also, it goes through the deconvolutional layers, which can make the high level information into the con into the semantic level information. So finally, it can output a pixel-wise semantic segmentation. Such as you can see, the input image shows the image of the road. It contains sky trees, the road, and some cars. And the segmentation result labels the each object into a different colors. And the fusion stream, after we get the uh, 3D model from the our tracking and reconstruction stream, and the output of the contact detection, which is uh, this kind of image with semantic labels of each frame. So we need to solve the problem how to, recon how to fuse these semantic labels into the 3D models. And here, we use the Bayesian fusion precise, which basically can map all the 2D semantic labels into the 3D models, and also based, based on the uh, probability of the labels. And after that, we implement a 3D CR refinement. The idea is to is that the uh, similar pixels with the same with the, uh, very near positions with the same uh, colors should belong to the same uh, label. And also, it can use 3D formations such as the normal directions uh, to optimize the label information. So basically, this is a kind of smoothing step to make the fusion more accurate. And with the output of the uh, track and reconstruction stream, and also the output of context detection and fusion stream, we can have an interaction MR system based on these outputs. So here, we implement a material-aware interactive MR game. You can see that it can detect different materials of the object, such as paintings, glass, fabric, wood, and carpet. Uh, the idea is that we can um, we can have virtual objects such as a ball, and it can um, interact with different real world objects, such as it can jump in the car park and it can um, throw into the fabric object, so it has different response. Here we use a Microsoft Connect as an input sensor, and for tracking and reconstruction stream, we use a Connect Fusion. Which is an open uh, which and an open sourced implementation called Kinfu. And for context detection and fusion stream, we use CRF or an trained on a material uh, database called Mink. And finally, we use Unity 3D to implement an interactive MR interface. And next, let's see a demo of our. MR system. So here is an AR shoot game. That apparently the gun is a virtual object, and we can shoot into the real objects such as wall, and wooden, and uh, tables. You can see that you have different chips: the wooden chips, the glass chips, and the feathers. If you shoot into different places. And here's another demo, we implement an AR through in place. So basically you can through place into different real world objects, such as a table, and the wall, and the chairs. Apparently if you through place into chairs and books, which is soft, it won't break. 
but if you squeeze it into the wall or the glass has it will the plates will break and also waste different glasses chips or wooden chips. So here you can see how it works. Basically it has a symmetrical layer information and the virtual part interact with the symmetrical layer. Alright, so here comes the evaluation. We want to know how accurate is our framework. So we did an accurate study. So the idea is that we take the input video view and we did a manual segmentation on the input video view, which uh, we can say that we have a lot of ground truth segmentation. And also we take the semantic view from our reconstruction and tracking system. And then lastly, we compare the semantic view with the ground truth segmentation, and we can get the evaluation result. So here shows our accuracy study. We compare uh, our method with FCN, CRFIN, and also our method without CRF refinement. We can say that our, our final result is much better than FCN, CRFRN, and also our result CRF refinement. And our result is more close to the ground truth. And for the, for the quantitative study, we compared the pixel accuracy, mean accuracy, mean IOU, and frequency weighted IOU. And all these metrics are measured outperforms with the FCN and CRF IRN. And also, we did a user study to set uh, to show how our uh, semantic information, semantic interaction can improve the IMR user experience. We recruited 28 undergraduate students, and the students were asked to play the through in place IMR game with three predefined conditions, which is no collision match, so it can still pay plates into the objects but the place will flow to the infinity and also uniform collision mass where the object will uh, where the place will break when it uh, contacts with different objects even with the chair and finally the semantical collision mass which you can superlate to different objects and it will, it will have different interactions and the candidates were asked to rate the MR experience on the scale of 1 to 10 based on quality of MR interaction and realism. And the result is very impressive that with a semantic uh, collision mesh, it gets much higher score than the no collision mesh and uniform collision mesh. Finally, Let's have a summary of today's presentation. So today, we present a context-aware MR framework, which is consisted of two main streams, the tracking and reconstruction stream to provide the camera pose and 3D model of the environment, and also a context detection and fusion stream to provide uh, a semantic segmentation and also the 3D semantic model of the environment. And also we provide a material aware interactive MR game based on our context aware MR framework. We made a MR shooting game so that you can shoot to anything uh, with the real interactions. And also a MR through in place game and you can throw unlimited plates with no waste onto anything with different interaction. And finally, we did a, a curious study of our context-aware IMR framework. And it shows that it can improve the semantic, semantic segmentation accuracy. And also, we did a user study 
and ensures that all contexts where virtual real interaction can greatly improve the IMR experience. However, it is worth notice that unlike physics, many natural interactions are not easily defined or represented for machine to understand, such as what will happen if we pour in virtual water onto a real TV. We believe that answering such big questions should be an essential part of the future work, which will enable the next generation of MR with the help of the artificial general intelligence, which can understand everything. We hope that our initiative on the application of AI on MR offers a new insight for the future of MR and bridges the gaps between the virtual and real world in context of their interaction. This is today's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice presentation. Uh, let's uh, see if there are any questions in the in the chat. In the Discord. Otherwise, while we wait, I have a, at least a, a couple. First one is uh, uh, about uh, the user study that you have done. The, 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 I, I saw uh, that the, the number of people involved was uh, ra 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 rather significant, 28 people. But what was the experience of these people with respect to with virtual reality games? Because actually this is something that is not quite yet standard among uh, a lot of uh, young students uh, that uh, are or, or undergrads. So actually could be something that uh, uh, affected the result of the user study or not? Yes, uh, this is an interesting question. So, uh, in our questionnaire, we have several options about their previous background of the AR and IMR or the FPS game. So, uh, and we did some study and analysis about this, how about these options and this background can affect our uh, evaluation results. And the study shows that the uh, whether they have or not the AR or MR experience, it doesn't affect our uh, final result of or uh, on the quality of the AR and MR experience of our three systems. Uh, it still shows that it comes uh, or contacts a my aware MR system that constantly improve our MR experience in terms of the quality and the realism. Okay, let's see if there are any other questions. No. Okay, just a final question. Uh, what about dynamic machines? Because uh, most of the, the things that you are showing is, is uh, rather static. And uh, besides including the, the physics of the machines, I think that also the dynamicity of the, the properties of the machine could be something that could be uh, taken in, 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 into account could be doable or the pipeline that you have uh, for, for uh, the, the uh, detection of the materials and everything is uh, not yet ready for making this stuff uh, dynamic. Yes. Um, actually, the um, dealing with the dynamic stuff is always a challenging part of the camera tracking or the um, semantic segmentation. And uh, uh, we always like some statical uh, scenes, such as in the office, and there's no people, and there's nothing changed, uh, because that if there are dynamic objects, such as people working, and uh, it will affect the accuracy of the camera tracking, which could uh, affect the uh, user experience of the IMR system. So, I mean, this is a, uh, very challenging problem, and uh, I think this is the next step. That's uh, the slime slime system and the semantic segmentation system need to improve. 
Okay. I see that there are no other questions. I see that we are just also longing and running a bit long. So I think that uh, this concludes uh, our session. Let's uh, thanks again uh, the presenters and uh, the audience for making interesting questions and making the discussion lively. Thanks again to everyone. Goodbye.